In this lecture, Dr. Gary Fetke talks about nutrition and lifestyle diseases. This is a pretty hard session. I'm not going to get you all to stand up and move around today. I'm not going to do that. But I am going to muck around with your head. Uh, Jason's just done it. I think the whole week, the whole weekend of talks is about making you reconsider everything. What you've actually thought was actually normal may not in fact be the best way to, to practice. And certainly I've found this whole topic challenging because I've had to actually take a 180 degree turnaround in the way I've practiced. Tim Noakes has done that. Every one of the speakers here has been trained in a traditional fashion and struggled with that whole concept. And then we've all hopefully done a bit of a rethink. In the last few months, I've started to rethink the whole concept of cancer. And so I'm putting together a whole jigsaw puzzle of hundreds of articles, a few minor assumptions, and I hope to challenge you a little bit. I'm going to start with this quote. So you think you need sugar, cancer needs it even more. That's the take home message. Have we gotten the model of cancer wrong? All right. I've got a question for you. Who thinks here that cancer is a problem of chromosomal damage? Come on, I mean, be honest. Who thinks it's related to genetics? Let's go back, for me, three months, six months. Well, that's what we've been taught. What if that chromosomal damage is just a marker of disease and not the cause? There's something to really reconsider. And we're going to explore that today. The most dangerous phrase in the English language is we've always done it this way. What if the chromosomal model is wrong? Okay. I want you to consider the primary problem is nothing to do with chromosomes and it's all tied up with glucose metabolism. That the chromosomal changes that we see just happen to be there at the scene of the crime and the blame is the cause but in fact just the effect. So have we been travelling the wrong path for 90 years? And I'll come back to why it's 90 years in a minute. If so, this opens up a whole new way of managing cancer, preventing it, managing it, treating it. And I'm going to blame the microscope. Okay? The microscope has distracted us from a metabolic model. It's my Ansel Keys of the cancer world. Okay? We ran down that low fat pathway and here we are 50, 60 years down the track reconsidering that maybe we did the wrong thing. Well the microscope's an inanimate object and I can't really blame it personally. And there won't be books written about it. The microscope, I don't think, has been on the front cover of Time magazine. But the microscope gave us the cholesterol plaques described in 1910. They looked underneath, looked into the cholesterol plaques and realised that they had 20 to 25 times the amount of cholesterol than in a normal aortic vessel wall. And they looked down the microscope, saw those cholesterol plaques, and as a result of that, we chased the cholesterol myth for decades. We now know effectively that that cholesterol we see in the blood vessel wall is pretty well just a marker of cardiovascular disease. It's not the cause. I think the microscope gave us the chromosome to blame for cancer. They're both victims of circumstance. They're both at the scene of crime, but not the cause. Just like firemen at a fire, do we blame the firemen for fires? And certainly getting rid of the fireman doesn't really solve the problem of the next fire, does it? And certainly attacking chromosomal changes with radiotherapy and chemotherapy and creating more damage doesn't seem to make a lot of sense either. It certainly doesn't solve the problem of cancer because we've still got the problem of cancer. And I'm going to try and prove that all to you in one picture coming up, okay? To make you reconsider the whole concept. And I've challenged several oncologists and cancer specialists with this in the last few months. And I've asked them, what does a PET scan mean? Most of you know what a PET scan is. Positron emission tomography, okay? It's a measurement of glucose metabolism and it's used in the management of cancer and particularly in advanced cancer and it lights up. The more aggressive the disease, the more it lights up. You acknowledge that? It's well recognised. 
how come every single cancer has the same positive PET scan? Doesn't matter if it's breast cancer, bowel cancer, prostate cancer, sarcomas, even the myeloid tumours will light up on a PET scan in their advanced case. So all of these cancers have the same metabolic pathway. They all have the same upregulation of glucose metabolism. And what are the chances of multiple chromosomal abnormalities all ending up with one metabolic pathway? Isn't it more likely that one metabolic pathway is then firing off masses of oxygen-free radicals into our genetic material, causing a wide variation of DNA changes and chromosomal abnormalities? And that's what we're then seeing as a chromosomal change. Now, I'm not uh, new to this. There's a fellow by the name of Otto Warburg that tried to tell us this in 1924. Won the Nobel Prize not for this, but in mitochondrial uh, uh, study in science in, in 1931. And he went to his death as a Nobel laureate trying to tell the world, as late as the 1950s, you've gotten it wrong, cancer is a metabolic disease based on mitochondrial respiration. Now the great thing about Warburg, which I've come to recognise, is he was a bit like John Yudkin was to sugar. But he was raised in an era of a research unit that was unhindered by research funding and ethics committees. In the 1920s, the German government decided to actually put a lot of funding just into people to get them to think and do what they wanted. His colleagues were Einstein, his students was Krebs. He's in, he, he, was, he's a, he was a giant. Anyway, he described fermentation of glucose by aerobic glycolysis, glycolysis and I'll come back to that. And that was called the Warburg effect. Who here has heard of Warburg? Excellent, we're off to a running start. Warburg described the diversion of glucose away from energy production towards cell growth, and specifically towards phospholipid metabolism, as it's turned out. And he described this aerobic glycolysis. He knew that it was a defect in mitochondrial disease, and specifically that's what we're going to look at. I think we've ignored the common metabolism of cancer, and that's our current cancer management. And if we're going to consider the future of cancer management, maybe we can consider a metabolic ma model with the potential to starve cancer. And I think that's all about nutritional ketosis. Nutritional ketosis is bad for cancer. It is about not having an elevated blood glucose. It's about not having an insulin and IGF spike in your bloodstream. And it's about the protective effect of ketones on the cells around a cancer. So I think the real problem of cancer is based around energy production, ATP, with, from ATP production from glucose and even from ketones in a normal cell, with secondary chromosomal damage. The beauty is that all cancer goes, undergoes the same metabolic pathway. ATP is the lifeblood of every living organism. And I think we can explain away the cancer model. So my metabolic model of cancer today is around growth and growth with random chromosomal mutations that are secondary. And cancer growth requires building blocks and they're either sourced locally or they're transported in. And glucose is the primary fuel for growth. It's transported in massive amounts and that's what we see on a PET scan and that's called the Warburg effect. The other building materials protein, fatty acids, acetate, phosphate, and cancer steals that from its surroundings. This is the overview. We're going to go into it in a bit more detail. Interesting, that stealing of the nutrients from around it is actually called, just to confuse you, the reverse Warburg effect. So I got my head around the Warburg effect, and then all of a sudden I started reading about the reverse Warburg effect. But I've simplified it down, and I have run this past an associate professor of biochemistry to just make certain I'm not too much of a fool today. And that invasion of the surrounding cells accounts for invasion and metastasis, 
or it plays an integral role. The driving force behind that is again, my favourite friends, oxygen free radicals. They're the ones that cause those random damages to the DNA. That's the cause of our chromosomal abnormalities. It's not the marker. It, uh, the, the, ab that abnormality is the marker. But I think we now need to go back, what's the source of the oxygen free radicals? And if those of you here yesterday, I think it's inflammation. And I think that inflammation drives oxygen free radical production. If we can unlock that key, maybe we can unlock cancer. And not surprisingly, I think the modern diet's related to it. I don't think it's sugar. I do not think it's carbohydrate. I don't think it's polyunsaturated oils in isolation. But in just the wrong combination, in the wrong amounts over a long enough period of time, I think it's highly inflammatory. It's the source of a mass of oxygen-free radicals. Welcome to my model of cancer. If we consider this model, then we've got new treatment options. Most of all, we can starve it if we find the right points of intervention. So let's start directing our treatment at the cause of the damage and not the chromosomal replication. Now, to me, when I started working on this, it started to make sense. The pieces of that jigsaw, all those hundreds of articles I'd been reading, started to lock in. I went, how did we get it wrong? Very much where I was a few years ago when I looked at the whole concept of obesity, diabetes, what most of the other speakers have been speaking about today. I think Mother Nature is beautifully simple. Everything in Mother Nature is simple. If you haven't worked out the simplicity of it, you just haven't worked it out. And you will get it one day. And so the whole low-fat, low-carb concepts that we've been discussing, it's all of a sudden pretty obvious. You know, the more we listen, the more we go, hang on, how can we just be missing this as a topic? So what doesn't make sense? Well, the genetic model of cancer doesn't make sense to me. You know, we know there's DNA damage in, ca in cancer. Yet our, key, our, radio, you know, our treatments of chemotherapy and radiotherapy is aimed at destroying that ongoing replication process and creating more tissue damage, more inflammation, more oxygen-free radicals. We just haven't worked out where those oxygen-free radicals are coming from. So we're going to go through a few flaws. Okay. Across all cancers, there's increasing incidence. Western cancers are developing in countries which have adopted a Western diet. Throughout Asia, they're now getting Western cancers. And by that, I mean I'm talking about breast, prostate, some of the bowel cancers. Children's cancers on the increase. How do we get multiple chromosomal abnormalities and still call it the one cancer of that organ? Okay. In a cancer, you, in let's say a breast cancer, it can have dozens of different chromosomal abnormalities, yet it's still called breast cancer. And one person's breast cancer to another person's breast cancer can have different chromosomal abnormalities. All you're ever identifying is the tissue of origin, not the genetic abnormality. You note the genetic abnormalities, and we chase the genetic abnormalities, and we've spent billions of dollars on cancer research, for heaven's sake, on chasing those individual genetic abnormalities. But there's so many mutations out there, and targeted genetic therapy hasn't worked. 5% of cancers have no chromosomal abnormalities. Well, hang on. I'm not going to swear. I'll put three letters up there. We've talked about these strong family histories. Well, if you really look hard at these strong family histories, there's only about 10% of them are familial. But families eat the same way, don't they? Generation after generation. We've spent billions of dollars on the genome map. You know, we've identified the gene. We've mapped it all out. It was going to be the great cure. Who can remember that? You know, 20 years ago, the genome, we're going to work it out. We'll solve cancer. Well, it hasn't. It's been an abject failure. There's one or two uh, uh, lymphomas which have been reasonably well identified, but that's about it. And the radiotherapy and chemotherapy that we inflict upon our patients make us sick. And if you read the side of the box of chemotherapy or listen to the side effects of radiotherapy, they can cause cancer. All right? It's well recognised. Thomas Seafried, 
and spent a lot of effort on this. He's one of the pioneers of this in the last 30 or 40 years. He's carried that baton along with Peter Peterson from Warburg. You know, this whole Warburg thing almost was forgotten, except for these two guys in the last 60 or 70 years. And um, I borrowed this slide. This is really quite interesting. If you get a normal cell and you replicate it, guess what? You get more normal cells, right? It's pretty sensible. If you get cancer cells and you replicate and grow, then you get more cancer cells. But if you get the nuclei of cancer cells and you put them in normal cytoplasm, guess what? You get normal cells. That's what they've studied. It's even better. Let's get some normal nuclei and put them in abnormal or cancerous cytoplasm, then you get more cancer. There's almost a genetic model thrown out. Right? This is a, not, this is a, a disease, a malignancy of something that's not in the nucleus. It's something in the cytoplasm. Again, my other flaw, how can the PET scan be positive the same for all different cancers? Same metabolic pathway, all glucose based. So a new model of cancer, I think, is based around growth pathways and metabolism. And again, I like to go through this in a stepwise fashion. What observations can we make? What are the mechanisms? What associative intervention evidence do we have? And again, we got to the top of the food chain over a couple of million years. We've been on a fad diet for the last 50 or 60 years. And in that time frame, our rates of cancer are going up and up and up. One in two men are going to get cancer. One in three women. We missed out again there, guys. Estimated 70% increase in the amount of cancer in the next 20 years, particularly in developing nations. And there's a slow but steady increase in children's cancer across all malignancies, 3% per annum. Up and up and up. I mean, we're not, you know, children are the same as they were you know, 200 years ago. If we look at the modern diet and the introduction, Wherever it's been introduced, we start seeing cancer. The Inuit Eskimos have been studied quite effectively, and over a long period of time, they didn't, cancer wasn't documented until the introduction of Western food. Same thing with, with New Guinea natives. Uh, I've got a colleague who used to work up there, he's well retired now, and he noted, as a, as a radiotherapist, that the introduction of cancer came with the introduction of KFC. Now, I'm not blaming KFC, but that's the timing of the introduction of Western food. I did some work in Vanuatu, some foreign aid work. That's in the middle of the Polynesian Islands. They've got new cancer, which they didn't have 15 years ago, 10 years ago. They're noting it. They're going, hang on, where did this come from? It's all timely. And even on your back doorstep, 1923, Dr. Fuchs, Dr. Orange Free State, wrote a letter to the British Medical Journal. I never saw a single case of cancer in any form in a native, although these diseases were frequently seen amongst the white European population. I was flying out here today, coming over and sat, asked the passenger next to me if I was over the Orange Free State. He said I'd missed it. <laughs> we know with obesity that there's an increasing incidence and poorer prognosis of cancer. The same thing goes with diabetes, an increasing incidence and poorer prognosis. Are we seeing a pattern here over the last few days? These are all just observations, no proof. What mechanisms have we got? Okay, well, I'm going to go back to cell energetics. You know, I'm an orthopaedic surgeon. I'm going to simplify the biochemistry down, and apologies if I get it you know, not quite right, but I'm trying to take some really complex stuff. Well, let's just look at it in big, broad principles. The common features of all cells is energy, ATP production. It's the energy, it's, of, it's the life of every cell. But you also need building materials for growth and maintenance. Those cells can be fueled by either sugar or fructose and glucose or ketone bodies. That fuel is normally turned in a normal cell primarily into energy production adenosine triphosphate. What's interesting about cancer cells, they can't metabolise ketone bodies. Ah, we've got one interesting point right from the word go. A cancer cell, again, isn't particularly interested in energy, it's about growth. 
So it doesn't produce as much ATP as we see in a normal cell. It needs lots of building materials and it's focused on the whole growth. And that's the Warburg effect. The fermentation of glucose by aerobic glycolysis down the pathway towards production of phospholipids for cell membranes and the backbone of, a, um, of DNA. So again, a normal cell, right, in the presence of oxygen converts glucose to pyruvate, undergoes oxidative phosphorylation, and we get around about 36 ATP as a result of that. That's under the direct influence of insulin and insulin growth factor one. What happens in a cancer cell, the Warburg effect? Whether or not you've got oxygen or no oxygen, glucose is converted to pyruvate, same thing, but instead of going down the oxidative phosphorylation pathway, it undergoes aerobic glycolysis with a net result of only producing about 4 ATP. Significant difference. Again, it's under the influence of IGF, uh, insulin and IGF-1. And that diversion without dragging in the pentose phosphate pathway and making the diagram too complicated, that diversion goes down towards the pathway of actually making more phospholipid for cell membranes, mitochondrial membranes, and to making the backbone of DNA with the ribose 5-phosphate backbone. The Warburg effect needs glucose. A cancer requires glucose. They cannot use ketones as a fuel source. However, the surrounding non-cancerous cells can use ketones. We know that. It's called nutritional ketosis, and it's been talked about a bit. So therefore, we've actually got some points of intervention. We could actually cut down our glucose load, which would mean less promotion of growth. And if we decrease the availability of carbohydrates as an ingestion, and we therefore have a lower insulin in our bloodstream and a lower IGF-1 if we don't let our protein go up. IGF-1 is actually related as much to protein ingestion as much as anything else. So we don't want our protein levels to go way up. Ultimately, we've got less promotion of growth. So in our building model, we need glucose, no question. But we also need other building materials. And that's protein, fatty acids, phosphate, acetate. They're not easily available, they're not easily transportable, and so they need to be stolen. This is the reverse Warburg effect, it's described by Lasanti in 2011. By local tissue invasion, the cancer cells get hold of those things. How does a cancer cell steal those? Well, back to aerobic glycolysis again, a glucose-dependent pathway, a significant amount of oxygen-free radical production. Those oxygen-free radicals react with the tissue water and create hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is quite toxic. It's been studied, and it, in fact, affects the fibroblasts so that it's sitting around the outside of a cancer cell. We've got an immune system in there which is trying to wall off this damaged tissue. It's a fibroblast response. That's our first response that the body does. Following on from that, what's the cancer going to do? It's releasing hydrogen peroxide. It's a battlefront. But ultimately, that cancer keeps winning if we keep fueling it with the primary fuel source of glucose. We get more oxygen-free radical production. We end up with more peroxide being released, more tissue damage. Tissues release the materials that we require We've got a model of invasion, and all of a sudden our cancer cells got its glucose, its protein, its fatty acids, its phosphate, and its acetate. More and more oxygen free radicals are involved in that process. So, again, let's go chasing the oxygen free radicals. The other ones, the other trigger, the other ones that create the havoc, we're not quite certain how they do it where they do it, and that's still being worked out. Okay, this is all brand new stuff. Half of it's in my head, half of it's in the literature. But they do it. So if we can work out where they come from, maybe we can stop their generation. And in my mind, it's inflammation. 
Inflammation drives oxygen-free radical production. And I think we need to now relook at my nutritional model of, modern, of inflammation, which I presented yesterday. I'm going to swing through it. The modern diet's inflammatory. It produces a mass of oxygen-free radicals. Now, culprits are sugar, particularly the fructose, the refined carbohydrates and the polyunsaturated oils. And it, this will all be back up on YouTube at some time. But again, I'm going to go through it, swing through it fairly quickly. If we increase the amount of fructose in our diet over a long period of time, we start in increasing the amount of small dense LDL particles, low density lipoproteins, which are the ones which actually sit in our blood vessel walls in every single organ of the body. If we increase the amount of carbohydrate in our diet under the effects of the polyol pathway, and particularly if you're hyperinsulinemic, you're converting 30% of them into fructose, you're going to create more and more LDL particles. We then have the opportunity in a modern diet to fill them up with polyunsaturated oils. And I showed you some figures yesterday where that figure is certainly in the vicinity of 25% now polyunsaturated oils within our fat, within our LDL particles. It's not just within our LDL particles, it's also in our cell membranes. It's also in our mitochondrial membranes. Right, the source of all the problems we've got with mitochondrial problems. That will cause more and more inflammation. And at every single step along the pathway, we've got oxygen-free radicals being released all over the place. Welcome to modern cancer. This sits, makes sense to me. This sits better than all the other stuff that I've been learning for the last 30 years. So our points of intervention along the metabolic pathway, all right? We've got lots of points there. What happens if we just cut out sugar? Okay, that's a good idea. What happens if we just cut out carbohydrate? That's a good idea. Why don't we cut out polyunsaturated oils? Another good spot. We can use antioxidants at multiple sites. Well, why don't we just do the lot by cutting out processed food? That's my theory of the mechanism. Have we got any association evidence? Well, I think we've got some dietary evidence, we've got some drug evidence, and I think we've got some epidemiological evidence. And I'll go through that. So what dietary associative evidence have I got? What's the food industry given to us for the last 50 years whilst we've had an increasing rate of cancer? What's well, given us more processed food? Who's to blame for that? I am. You are. We are, all are. We've all demanded convenience food. Okay. We've all demanded cheap food. We've all demanded food with a long shelf life that's transportable. We've all demanded something that's sweet and tasty. And it's almost too good to be true, you know, cheap, tasty, healthy. Well, we've got two out of three, didn't we? So it's all processed food. So I think we're just as much to blame as the food industry. So back to the 1970s, we increased the amount of sugar consumption in the society. We increased the amount of refined carbohydrate consumption. And we certainly increased our polyunsaturated oil component. All with a corresponding increase in cancer. So we've got any drug association evidence for the metabolic model or for its treatment. And we'll talk about a few things. We've got aspirin, metformin, antioxidants, and vitamins. So let's look at aspirin. I'm not going to drag you through a hundred articles here, but in summary, okay, 43 random controlled trials on average around about reducing cancer death rates by about 15%, and overall reducing non-vascular death rates by about 12%. So there's a reasonable argument on a whole lot of meta-analysis that we should all be on a low dose of aspirin. Metformin decreases tissue glucose levels, okay, not necessarily blood glucose as much, and across the board, it's decreased incidence and with a prolonged survival. With near non-diabetic rates of cancer, with the introduction of them in, with patients who are diabetic, and particularly in women, so they're more effective with women. Again, the guys we've lost out again there, but not a lot, not a lot. Now, there are multiple papers talking about the benefits of antioxidants. You hear them on the health channels, you see them in the press, they crop up. They were varying quality, and I've got to admit, I haven't seen them all, but I've read about 40 or 50 of them. 
but there are clear benefits, according to those papers, of eating fresh food. Where they work is academic, and I think there's multiple spots of oxidation that's occurring, and therefore there's multiple spots where they might affect. Vitamins are involved in modifying inflammation as well as oxidation. Again, multiple papers on this. Some saying they're having an effect, some say they're not. And I think it's hard to draw some definitive conclusions. But we know that vitamin C is an antioxidant. It works on the uric acid effect on nitric oxidase. Vitamin E is an antioxidant as well. So based on history, we do have some epidemiological data. If we look backwards, rather than prospective controlled trials looking forward, if we look backward, our history tells us that the Inuit Eskimos had a very low rate of cancer. The New Guinea natives had a very low rate of cancer. The Orange Free State natives had a very low rate of cancer. I've gone back and tried to find some prehistoric data, you know, bones and everything that have gone back 50, 60,000 years. There is some evidence that cancer was present. Okay, sure, they died at a young age, but it certainly wasn't massive rates of cancer. But it is there. It's there in prehistoric bones. I've got to try and find a museum with something to have a look at at some point in time. It's another job. Communities around the world that live to a very old age have a very low rate of cancer. I talked about these blue zones, described by Dan Butner a few years ago. And the common factor is not what they eat, it's what they don't eat. They don't eat sugar, refined carbohydrates and polyunsaturated oils. And they have a very strong sense of spiritual and community awareness and low stress. So I think we do have some association evidence for a metabolic model for cancer and treatment, or certainly for uh, cancer management. Have we got any um, laboratory studies? H human studies. I'm going to also look at miracle cures. And whilst I'm delving into the, the unknown this afternoon, I thought I'd challenge you because I think the last few weeks I've come up with the biochemistry of religion. Which will be interesting. We'll see how it's re received. And how, bi how religion links in with cancer. Pretty cool if we work that one out today. OK, looking at laboratory data, there's 63 animal studies that at least I'm aware of that show that calorie and carbohydrate restriction slow cancer growth. The calorie restricted ones are generally carbohydrate restricted by nature, but the ketogenic diets are, tend to be more effective than the calorie restricted ones. And this forest plot here shows some of those studies, and you can see that the pictures, the results to the left are showing that they're having some benefits in slowing down growth of cancer, increased survival of uh, predominantly mice, um, but nonetheless, there, there is there's quite a lot of work out there, at least on a spir experimental level. Human intervention studies are small, small numbers, not a lot of them, but they're there. Small numbers that unfortunately all end stage cancer patients. Somehow or other, these are the only ones allowed to enter into trials. But across the board, ketogenic diets are seen to be safe in that group. It was well studied. It's the first thing. All the pilot trial studies, 10 patients, 16 patients, 8 patients, 2 patients, they're there, but they are safe. For those patients that stick with it for the period of time, it seems to stabilise their disease. Not cure, seems to stabilise. We're just talking about in isolation, but it's there. There are currently 15 registered trials that I'm aware of, if you look up clinical trials, that are actually looking at ketogenic diets in the management of cancer. Breast cancer, quite a few in brain cancers, head and neck as well as pancreatic cancer. Anecdotally, this is happening, okay? There are a few institutions that I've spoken to, a few colleagues who are interested in it, and if you listen to the naturopaths and the miracle cures around, certainly there's lots of anecdotal stories that are out there about this topic. Clearly needs more research to be published. There's a paper that came across just fairly recently as well. Ketogenic diets are protective. Raffigello got a whole lot of mice, gave them lethal doses of chemotherapy. 
in one group and in the second group he starved them and then gave them the same doses. He starved the mice into nutritional ketosis and 96% of them survived. Whereas the group that were not starved and we just had the normal diet only had a 34% survival. So that in itself is suggestive that ketogenic diets, nutritional ketosis, may in fact have a protective effect on the cells around. And it makes sense because if you're starving the cancer and you've flipped into ketosis, the ketone bodies are in the cells around and acting as fuel. Clement and Champ, 2014, this is a great article, but effectively a conclusion was, if you're going to do this, you want to be in ketogenic diets, you want to dramatically decrease your carbohydrate intake. You want to bring down your protein level a bit. You know, with, there's some benefit maybe in caloric restriction, but you definitely want to increase your fat. So I grabbed a few copies of Miracle Cure books. Couldn't fit them all on the one slide. And again, I'd like to read a book, but I don't like to read the book. I like to read between the lines. It's quite a long read, but then you can speed read, OK? The common theme of all of these books is avoid sugar and don't underestimate the power of hope and of taking back control. The power of hope and taking back control. If you have a positive attitude, it improves your survivability. This group of people followed over 20 years. The ones that had lung cancer, who had an optimistic attitude, an optimistic uh, personality on average lasted six months longer than those that didn't. So the optimists survive a bit longer. So whilst we're talking about attitude, I'm going to talk about the biochemistry of religion. Where does religion fit into this whole equation? And what have all religions got in common? What do they all practice for health and spiritual well-being? And I propose that the state of well-being, the state of health, is in fact achieved by fasting. By achieving a state of nutritional ketosis, it's about not having glucose. It's about not having an elevated blood glucose. It's about not having an insulin spike. It's about not having an IGF-1 spike. And traditionally, it's about not eating processed food. I believe nutritional ketosis is good for your health and it's bad for cancer. Christianity has Lent. Islam has Ramadan. Buddhists intermittently fast every day. It's observed by all religions in some forms or another. They had it worked out thousands of years ago. They recognised the health benefits of nutritional ketosis. All I'm telling you now is why. I think it's been there, it's been staring us in the face. I woke up with that idea about a month ago, so I think it's there. I'd like to thank Jason Fung for this res uh, reference yesterday. I thought it was great. Here's another reason we've stopped fasting. We're no longer in nutritional ketosis. We're all eating too frequently. There's a steady increase now from a couple of times a day, with eating and snacking five or six times a day. Fasting and nutritional ketosis cannot happen with all the eating that we're doing. There's never an opportunity to get into ketosis. So let's look at church attendance in Australia over the last 60 years. Steady decrease in numbers attending church. I'm not too fussed about that. But if you're not attending church and you're not following that spiritual pathway that our forebears used to do, then you're probably not getting into the practice of whatever that religion is and therefore you're avoiding the fastings. You know, it doesn't really matter if we have a little bit extra here and there. So religious practices, when they were indoctrinated into our society, meant that you did fast. And as church attendances decrease, our current cancer rates are increasing. Now, some of you may think that's a bit of a long bow, but again, it sort of makes sense. You know, our forebears have done a few things right in the past. They've observed things and they've made decisions based on their observations. So I do think we've got some intervention evidence. 
Our current treatment is based on the chromosomal abnormality. The treatment's clearly toxic to us. It targets cell duplication. And we know that radiotherapy and chemotherapy can actually cause cancer. Our current treatment still encourages unrestricted sugar and carbohydrate consumption. Oh, you poor thing, you've got cancer, have a cake. Come down to the pub, let's get smashed, all right? But I think our future treatment has to focus on starving cancer in one form or another. And I think that nutritional ketosis is bad for cancer and it's protective of the cells around cancer. So I think low carb, healthy fat eating and going into nutritional ketosis is safe. Make the environment unpleasant and use it with the other treatment. I'm not saying abandon chemotherapy or radiotherapy, but you can sensitize that tumor to then being attacked in a greater fashion. The ketones are protective of the surrounding cells. Does it give the patient some control? Does it give them some control? Absolutely yes. Does it give them some hope? Yes. If it's good enough for treatment, then shouldn't we apply it for prevention? It costs nothing. It's the cheapest treatment of them all. I'm regularly challenging my oncologist in the hospital to stop wasting my tax money and spending $100,000 on people in their last two or three months of life. Let them die with dignity. So does the genetic model hold up? Well, I actually don't think so. I think there's another way to look at cancer based on energy and building blocks and how they all grow. The Warburg and glucose metabolism explain that PET scan to me, finally. And the other materials that a cancer cell needs to grow are explained by the reverse Warburg effect. The metabolic model gives us a whole new concept of treatment options. Multiple sites of intervention which haven't been explored for decades. Let's make that cancer pretty sick. Starving cancer is critical to that process. Nutritional ketosis starves the cancer of glucose and protects the tissue. Surround it. A toxic environment makes it hard for the cancer to grow. It's not guaranteed to stop it. I'm not proposing this as a cure. It may be preventative, but I think it's a really, really good thing to start thinking about. Now I do have a declaration of interest here. Okay, it's personal interest. I was raised on sugar, carbs and polyunsaturated oil. Fifteen years ago, I had my tumour. I began my journey with cancer. You have a vested interest in a topic when it affects you. When you hear the words, you have cancer, I can guarantee you those words strip you of hope. It sucks the very breath out of your life. It does. You can feel it. And if you've had cancer and you've had some major crisis in your life, you will often go, <gasps> and if you haven't do it, and I did it then and I had goosebumps because I can remember it. I had young children at the time. There is a complete sense of helplessness for you and your family. I had brain surgery twice, so you don't need to trust anything I say. <laughs> I had radiotherapy and I had chemotherapy. My PET scan was positive and it took me 14 years to work out, oh, I'd never heard of the term nutritional ketosis. I had no concept of missing a meal, let alone fasting. And in 2000, processed food was feeding my cancer. I've decided to starve it of glucose. I've decided to starve it of insulin and IGF-1 as well. I'm allergic to carbs in my mind. I'm in nutritional ketosis. My weight's come down. And last year I stopped my chemotherapy. What's interestingly is my markers have all started to come down. Now that's an N equals one study. My MRI is unchanged. 
I still have some active tissue there. It's a little rot wheel that sits in the corner of my life and has for a long, long time. That's why I'm here today, because I don't want that to happen to others. And occasionally that rot wheel is barking, but it hasn't barked for a long time now. So my tumour is stable. I have hope now because I've got a vested interest. So I do think we did go down the wrong way. I think that microscope distracted us for about 80 years. I do think that chromosomal damage is a marker of cancer and not to blame. It's just there at the scene of the crime. I challenge you to consider this with an open mind. To consider that the primary problem of cancer is in fact glucose metabolism. The distinguishing feature is the model of inflammation that sits underneath it, and that is our processed food in the amount and the combination that we have. And for me, it's opened up a whole new way of managing cancer. It certainly has for me. So you think you need cancer? No, oh, sorry. So you think you need sugar? No way. Cancer needs it even more. Thank you very much for listening.